Hi, welcome to Talking Sunday Readings. My name is Ann Carter. I am joined as always by Pastor Richard Stadler and Tim Carter, and we are um, discussing and engaging in conversation uh, regarding the text lessons that have been chosen for the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. And those lessons are from the Old Testament Ecclesiastes, several verses uh, from chapter one and then uh, chapter two, verses 18 through 23. Uh, the New Testament, we are still going through the book of Colossians. We are chapter 3, verses 1 through um, 11. And then we are uh, in the book of Luke, still Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. A reading from Ecclesiastes. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. I, the teacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless. A chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. Yet who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days their work is grief and pain, even at night their minds do not rest. This, too, is meaningless. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. To this, I see, is from the hand of God, for without him who can eat or find enjoyment? To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This, too, is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I will start out with Ecclesiastes, which um, I think I said the verse is wrong. We're going through verse 26. This is such an interesting book. It's kind of a downer. Uh, it is written by, uh, we believe, Solomon at the end of his life, who has had a fascinating life, and he's made a lot of mistakes. And here he is looking back, talking in hindsight about what has it all been worthwhile. Um, he, he looks at life through very jaded, depressed, sad eyes. Uh, and um, I guess that's my introduction. Tim, have you uh, got any your further thoughts? Um, no, well, my big thought is, or question is, is what, uh, is there any hope that can be derived from this passage? Um, everything seems pretty bleak and meaningless after reading this one. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering what hope can we derive? And uh, is there a message we should be driving aside from? Boy, life is tough sometimes. Life is tough. Um, in anticipation, because you gave that question ahead of time, mm -hmm. I looked through it and I, and I found a theme. Okay. And the theme is the teacher looked under heaven. He looked at everything that was done in verse 13, under heaven. In verse 14, I saw all the deeds that are done under the sun. And when he looked on this earth at all of the bickering and the quarreling and the greed and the, and the animosity, he didn't find much hope. Mm -hmm. What he had to do was look up and look with God's eyes and look at his work. And then there is hope because in God, all, none of your work, if you, the work that you do in the Lord is not in vain. That's what we find in the New Testament. Mm. Um, 
but man, the rest of this stuff, it's not very good. Well, there's a hint to that uh, in verse 26, the last verse of the reading, where he says, for the, to the one who pleases him, mm -hmm. God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. And a lot of people don't give a rip about getting wisdom, knowledge, and joy. Mm -hmm. What they want are things. And that's why he then says, if you're going to be striving after things and the kind of things that people put a high priority on, your life is going to be vanity. It's just going to be emptiness because at the end of your life, someone else is going to get the stuff. And he says that here in verse 26, but to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to one who pleases God. Wow. And so even the stuff that you're gathering will be some, uh, the person who puts his priority on staying close to God, listening to God, worshiping God, he will get enough to take care of himself. And some of the stuff that he gets may have been accumulated by someone who greedily was going after it themselves. Mm -hmm. And you're going to see a real tight connection between this Old Testament lesson mm -hmm. this Sunday and the gospel reading about a barn builder who, who's never could build enough barns. And um, I, it's just one of those great Sundays when the readings kind of connect in a, in, a, in a way together. But at the very beginning of chapter two, or the reading that we have, verse 18, he says, I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun. And so for a lot of people, that's a good description of their work. They hate it. They hate going to work. They can't wait to retire. They're working for retirement. Seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This is all vanity, he says. Mm -hmm. And that's such a true commentary on what happens. A lot of people will work their whole lives, long days, long weeks of work to accumulate stuff. And then they leave it to somebody else and they don't take care of the stuff. They let the house become decrepit. They let the lawn get filled with weeds. They, and all the things that they put on such a high priority on are suddenly nullified uh, by whoever takes possession of them. So this is a very depressing section in a way, but it's also a therapeutic section because it's saying, get your view right. View what is important here because that will then have a trickle over effect in, in your life of things. If you got a relationship with God and you're working on that, first of all, you'll learn to do what Paul says, whether I am rich or whether I am poor, I've learned to be content. And you can then rejoice, uh, even if you don't have all the things that your neighbor has, uh, because you've learned to keep things in priority. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is spoken by, if, if Solomon is the guy who wrote this, uh, a guy who really knew that from firsthand experience, because mm -hmm. he was filthy rich. And, and it was, and his words were proven true because after he died, everything that he built went to his son Rehoboam. And then because of Rehoboam's insolence, yeah. he lost it all. The kingdom was broken in two and everything that David and Solomon had built was gone. It's, it's, it, it proved very true. Um, without, if Tim, did you have any other comments? Nope. Or we'll go on to Colossians. Yeah, um, yeah. Because this ties in very well again with both Ecclesiastes and with Luke. In a reading from Colossians. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. 
Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. In that, in verse one, so if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Don't look down on this planet for, um, in this earth, in this existence for, for fulfillment or joy, because mm -hmm. it's not really going to happen unless you have Christ. Mm -hmm. Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth, because they will not last. Yeah. And if they last longer than you do, you're not going to be around to enjoy them. So keep, just keep perspective. Um, uh, you must get rid of such things that will separate you from God. Anger, malice, slander, abusive language. Those things will cause a divide and you need to be one with God. So you need to keep at it all the time. Um, Self-examination is very important that you know who you are and what God demands of you and where you are failing and ask him to help you. Those are my comments. Tim, what did you have? Um, well, my question is, is, I mean, how are we supposed to put aside all of these earthly things? Um, that's the big question. Um, it, because in, in this passage, and I don't see the verse offhand, but it sounds like we need to put aside all these earthly things because the God's wrath will be coming down or coming. Verse six. Yeah. Verse six. Yeah. Um, and first of all, how are we supposed to put aside all these things? How are we not supposed to be angry ever again? Or, or how do we fight anger in ourselves? Um, and also if we aren't able to do that, I mean, I thought we were all forgiven, but if God's wrath is coming, how do, how do we, how do we reconcile, I guess, this, this, verse six about the wrath with the forgiveness that we are promised i think there's such a thing as therapeutic fear hmm. and that's why um even the epistles or the scriptures say um that we work out your salvation with fear and trembling hmm. and the fear of losing your salvation and so the fact that we know the wrath of God is coming for those who have never received his forgiveness through Christ, we don't want to lose what we have in Christ. And so that is a therapeutic awareness that that is a reality that is going to occur. But now the question that you ask, I think, is the big one. How do we get rid of anger? Because all of us have it, like it or not, yeah. um, and especially during troubling polarized political times that everybody is probably yelling at their tv set from time to time when they listen mm -hmm. to people express themselves um and it, he doesn't say it specifically in here but he certainly urges us in the previous readings that we have from colossians is that um go to christ because he is everything he is in all he's the one who created everything so he can create this new you and he can create a you that will struggle against all of these things that you see happening in your life, even if you never accomplish it perfectly, but he'll keep working with you. He'll never give up on you. And so if, if you have to go back to him the 18th time, say, God, I lost my temper again. And I'm so sorry, uh, please help me get control of this thing. Uh, maybe that will stick with you for the rest of your life for a good reason, to keep mm -hmm. you repentant so that you never get self-righteous that's the worst thing that will that will lose salvation for you if you become so snob, snobbish that you think oh i'm one of the good guys here yeah. and um, i'm a lot better than that guy over there uh, but if you have to keep wrestling with your own failures and your own uh sins that's a healthy thing because that keeps drawing you back to christ and yeah. i think that's the answer uh, and don't expect yourself to ever be perfect because you won't you'd be setting yourself up but know that even in the midst of your imperfection christ will not give up on you yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. anything further or we'll move into the 
be fascinating. Oh, wait, story. yeah, before we move on, oh, okay. there is something good that we need to learn to celebrate as Christians who are sinner saints who are in this mixed bag. In verse 10, uh, you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And so rejoice that God is still putting into you the good things that you're capable of doing. Instead of looking at all the bad stuff, oh, I'm such a worm. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. And look at, I lost this. We also rejoice when he moves you to do something good. And you say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for helping me notice that guy that was on the off ramp. And I gave him three bucks out of my pocket, even though I'm not so sure he's not going to waste it. But you've told me to give and ask not in return. And so when we do those things that are Christ motivated, then if we can learn to say thank you, we might think of doing them more often. Yeah. If we kind of give positive reinforcement to ourselves. Yeah. Just a thought. We all are a work in progress. Exactly. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool! This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Uh, so to Luke 12, 13 through 21, um, it is a story, again, started with the dialogue with Jesus, and then Jesus uses a story, not necessarily even to answer the question, but to pose um, a, to present a situation in which the person who asks the question gets to come up with their own answer. It's this is another one where we don't know what the result is. We don't know. Um, we don't know what this, as in the story of the pair of, of the the father with the two sons. Um, we don't know what happens to the son um, whose father comes out and says, "Please come into the banquet." We don't know what his response is. Some of these are open ended. Um, there's a rich. There is a man who comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, be the arbiter here. I want my inheritance. My father's died. He's left my brother and me this inheritance. I want it divided. Jewish law said that if one of the brothers, one of the inheritors wanted to divide it, it could be divided. Roman law said that both people had to agree to it. Obviously, the other brother didn't agree to it, and this brother, the First brother comes to Jesus and says, I want you to handle this. Well, you know what? Jesus gets a little testy. He's not in the business of that. You, don't, you can't tell me what to do. But here, I'm going to tell you a story. If you're so interested in material things, as we talked about with Ecclesiastes, talked about with Colossians, here's what you should look for. Okay. There's a rich man. And he has everything he needs, obviously, if he's rich. And then God gives him more. The rich man, instead of thinking, who could I share this bounty with? There's a lot of poor people in my village. There's a lot of poor people in my family. I'm going to share it with them. No, the rich guy decides he's going to keep it all for himself and build a bigger barn. And he's going he's to eat, drink, and be merry. And then he's going to live his life in luxury and forget about anybody else. Forget about serving God. And God calls him to account. Now, there are several things that I found in here. Verse 18, the rich man says, he, it's my barns, 
my grain, my goods, my soul. Here's a, a man who is completely self-absorbed. Everything in his world is his. Now, he's probably married. He probably has kids. He probably has a household that he's responsible for. But he's not looking out for anybody but himself. And God says, that's not the way to do it. Um, with that, Tim, I will turn it over to you again. Um, well, the one, <clears throat> this seems pretty, not obvious, but it makes sense. I'm with it all the way. Um, mm -hmm. But this last verse 21 um, this is this is how it will be uh, with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. My question is, what does it mean to be rich toward God? Does that just mean giving up all of your money? Does that mean just like that I can store up all my things, you know, and, and have all my stuff as long as I am whatever, uh, you know, go to church and I'm good in other ways? Um, or, you know, how, how should we be looking at that? And how should we be reading that? Is it okay if I store up all my stuff? Because here, you know, in America, we've got a lot of stuff and we like our stuff. Mm -hmm. And does, does this mean we should get rid of all of our stuff? Is it, you know, um, how do we reconcile that? Or, or how should we read this passage to mm -hmm. pursue life in the best way? Do we have to be poverty stricken and paupers to be Christians? Yeah. Do we have to give up all of our TVs and everything? And and live on well, the I, I, yeah, I, I think that um, is a false alternative. And um, it, it, when we're rich toward God, we consider all that God wants us to have. And therefore, it's like John says in his epistle, I've written these things that you may know that you have eternal life. You go out on the street, and I've done this and interviewed hundreds of people. There are many people who do not know that they have eternal life. And many know for all the wrong reasons because they're not rich in God. They haven't received what God has given them. They think they're going to get to heaven if they do go up good. And they say, well, I hope I've done enough good. Uh, they're not rich at all in God. They're poverty stricken and they're bankrupt. Um, and, but when you get your relationship with God in place, then you realize you can thank God for the good house you have with the four car garage. You can thank God for the Mercedes that you may be driving. You can thank God for all the food that you're able to eat because you also realize that you're, you've got an obligation to share with other people and not just live for yourself. But you don't have to give it all away and become a monastic uh, monk uh, on top of a pillar in the middle of the desert in order to prove that you are rich with God. Uh, and look at some of the rich people in the scriptures who didn't give up all that they had. They just simply used it as good stewards. You had Lydia, who was a seller of purple, and you had all the women who were supporting the ministry of Jesus. And so they must have been, some of them must have had great means. Um, but um, I think that's an important reminder there that um, when we're rich in God, we can say thank you to God for the good things I do have, but I don't just do like the guy in the parable uh, and just think only of myself, as Anne said. Uh, and I think one other thing that Ken Daly pointed out, or somebody that I read recently, um, and that is in the Middle East, people consulted with one another when they made certain decisions. Mm -hmm. This guy is totally isolated. He doesn't talk to anybody else. He talks to his own soul. He doesn't collaborate with his neighbors. Hey, look at all this stuff I've got. Uh, are, can you think of some ways I can use this? Because I don't need it. You know, I got more than enough for me. Um, no, there, there's no evidence that he's even consulting anybody else. And maybe those who are rich in, in God also realize they're part of the family of God. And so they can trust, they can consult with other people and say, um, got any ideas about what I can do with this? Because I, I don't really need it. You know? and, and so he's pointing to a, a, a life that is communal, that is uh, sensitive to the other people around you, both those who are haves and those who are have nots. You know? So mm -hmm. and it's a good reminder. You know, God gives us a real good guideline in the Old Testament. He asks us to tithe. He asks us to give to him first a 10% or a portion, and then 
because by doing that, we think of him first and, and through that gift, his other people are taken care of. And then we do that knowing that our needs are going to be taken care of. We don't keep it all to ourselves because that just doesn't work. It doesn't, as a parent, you know, it doesn't work. Your children need things. As um, a child, you know, it doesn't work. Your parents need things. Your classmates need things, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we follow that basic rule. And then when we put God first, other, everything follows. It's, it's amazing, but it works. When we're rich toward God, it doesn't mean it's going to take all stress out of our life. I remember how stressful it was to go to India on the times we went there to teach and to do mission work. And we saw all these poor people begging. And our Christian host said, don't give them anything. Because if you do, you'll have a thousand of them descend upon you. That was the most difficult thing for me to be walking past these beggars and not reach into my pocket and at least pick, pick out a few uh, coins that I could give them. And I think the same is true when we come off an on, off ramp of the expressway and there's somebody standing there with a cardboard sign. Um, we can make all kinds of justifications for not giving that person, oh, they'll probably use it for drugs, they probably won't use it for any good. Um, but Jesus doesn't give us that choice. He stresses our life out by saying, give to anyone who asks you and ask not in return. And so there've been a lot of times when I have reached in my pocket, taken out some money, gave it to somebody, and I had no idea whether they're going to use it well or they're going to abuse it. Uh, that's not on me. That's on them. But what's on me as a Christian is to do what God wants me to do. And sometimes it means reckless with our love, just as he has been reckless with his love for an unthankful world. So, no, you know. Very good. Well, if there are any other comments, if not, I think we'll close this discussion for the day. Thanks, as always, for joining us in our conversation. Um, to Pastor Stadler, to Tim, um, we appreciate your support out there. We appreciate your prayers. Um, we appreciate your sharing us with others. See you again. <laughs>